Man, I am so glad that tonight I get to speak and I don't have to worry about the camera. Uh, we have a live pastor speaking, live pastor speaking. We have, I don't know how that came across, but it didn't come across the right way. But uh, we have live speaking on each of our campuses this weekend. And so I don't have to worry about the video, but I do want to remind you that when you do see us pastors on Saturday night, look to the camera and speak to the camera, it's because there's a whole other crowd on the other side of that camera. There's 300, 400 people on the other side of that lens. And so when we're looking into that, it feels awkward for us and it might feel awkward for you, but there's a purpose behind it. And we want you to know that. So we're not posing for some type of Christmas cameo when we look, you know, uh, it's besides Robert's the only one that looks good on the screen anyway when he's doing that. Uh, but that's our purpose and that's our point. Today we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 through 25. If you do not have a Bible, I want to encourage you, use the Bible that's underneath the seat in front of you. And if you don't have a Bible at your house, I want to encourage you, take that Bible home. Read it and apply it to your life. We just finished up the sermon series called Moral of the Story, where we encouraged you to, to apply those truths to your life. And as we look at the Christmas season, we're not looking at this Christmas season, the story of the birth of Jesus, just as a way to remind us of, of who Jesus is. We still want to experience life change. And as we look at the life of Joseph, as, not the life of Joseph, but as we look at the birth of Jesus, or as we begin to look at the birth of Jesus tonight, there are things, scriptural truths that we can draw out and apply to our lives if we allow ourselves to. It's one thing just to have head knowledge. It's a whole different thing to apply God's word to our lives and apply practical truths. When we do that together as a church family, we experience life change. The God's word changes our character. God's word changes our thoughts. God words, uh, God's word makes us compassionate for other people. God word, hum God's word humbles us when we apply it to our lives. So please don't just settle for hearing but let's apply God's word together. Uh, anybody excited about the Christmas season finally arriving? Yeah. All right, folks are excited about it. In nine days, my family of six is going to hop on a plane on Christmas Eve morning. We're gonna get on a plane and we're gonna fly into Atlanta and we're going to spend time with our in-laws and with our in-laws and with more in-laws. <laughs> And we're going to all be together. I think they plan for us to sleep on air mattresses or a camper or something. So, uh, you know, that Christmas is a time of year where you can pack family into tight places and it becomes a little bit awkward, doesn't it? It can get a little awkward when we hang out with family, especially family that we hardly know. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hand a lot tonight. So deal with it. And you're going to be living in sin if you don't raise your hand if something applies to you. Okay, so raise your hand if you plan on traveling to visit your family this Christmas season. Okay, raise your hand if your family is going to travel to visit you this Christmas season. See, you guys are the lucky ones. You are the one who we rise up and call blessed today. Uh, raise your hand if you love family, but you hate traveling. And raise your hand if you love traveling, but hate family. <laughs> you know, there's something, no, no, we don't hate family, right? We love family. If they were all like us, it would be awesome, right? If, we, if they are as smart as we were, as charming as we were, everything would go well with our family. I think about Christmas season, sleeping on air mattresses. Your kids are getting cry, tired and they're cranky and fussing, stressing out over Christmas shopping, in-laws arguing in front of the family, not my in-laws, but your in-laws. Uh, <laughs> strange odors around the house, things that you smell. The Christmas season could honestly be described as the awkward season. We see family in underwear that we never wanted to see in underwear before. <laughs> Nothing turns out the way that we planned it to. The food burns. The air mattress that you're sleeping on at night leaks and you wake up on the floor with your back aching. The family that's arguing gets so heated that people begin taking sides with one another. And the strange odors that you smell around the house actually turns out to be your own shoes. 
<laughs> Raise your hand if you have relatives that fall asleep in the living room and snore loudly. It's awkward. We end up tiptoeing around and we don't know where to turn on the TV. And it turns out the remote control is underneath the person that's sleeping and snoring loudly. Time together with extended family can be awkward. Today, what I want to do as we look at Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, is look at this Christmas story, this first Christmas story, and let's see together if there are biblical truths, relational truths, that we can draw out from the life of Joseph and Mary that we can apply to our own lives. I want to pass along four Christmas survival, I'm making sure I hold up four, four Christmas survival tips that will help you in your relationship with your awkward family this Christmas season. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found out to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, in order for us to fully understand this passage of Scripture, again, we have to understand the context, what the culture thought was right and wrong at the time, what the practices were at the time, especially in the area of marriage. Because Joseph is considering to divorce his wife, yet he wasn't really married to his wife. The passage says he was betrothed to her, but the passage also indicates that Joseph thought about divorcing her. So we have got to understand the culture in order to understand this passage of Scripture. Uh, so first in that day, the marriage was first arranged by the parents. Joseph's parents and Mary's parents is the one that arranged for them to get married. Secondly, a contract was prepared with the groom's parents paying a bride price to the bride's parents. So they literally bought Mary. It might have been with goats, it might have been with money, it might have been with land, it might have been with houses, but whatever it was, they paid a bride price for her. After the contract and the bride price was agreed upon, the marriage then became legally binding. There was an exchange of money, the marriage became legally binding, but they were not yet fully married. It was that fourth stage that Mo Joseph and Mary were in. That fourth stage, after the, it became legally binding and before the fourth stage happened, uh, that uh, the bride and groom still did not live together. The groom would go prepare his house for his bride. He would nail down the job for his bride or lock down a job for himself, lock down his income. And they would even enter a season of purity testing to make sure that each one was going to be faithful to the other one. And then after that season, after that time of being apart, being away from one another, they would come together. Joseph would show up at her dad's house, at Mary's house, take Mary with him back to his house where they would consummate the marriage or in other words, have sex. And once they had sex, then they were fully, not only legally, but then socially recognized as husband and wife. So here's the awkward situation that Joseph finds himself in. Mary has agreed to marry him. The bride's parents have agreed to marry him. He goes away for a time. He does not know her sexually. He doesn't have sex with her. He shows up, knocks on the door, and guess who's pregnant? His fiance. Talk about an awkward situation. 
He shows up at Mary's house and she says, surprise, honey, I'm pregnant. He knows it's not his baby. Now, humor me for just a moment. Men, close your eyes. Do it. Close your eyes. Do it. (laughs) Go back to the time and the place that you proposed to your wife. Do you remember how you felt when she said yes? Did your chest swell? Keep your eyes closed. Did your chest swell up with pride? Did you beam with love? Were you excited? Were you so glad that the gal you loved actually agreed to marry you? Keep your eyes closed. Now imagine after she said yes, you went away for seven to eight months on a business trip. You wrote her love notes. She sent love notes back to you. You returned home from your trip. You knocked on her door. You, she opened the door and she was pregnant. And it was not your baby because the two of you had not yet had sex. How would you feel? Yeah, Merry Christmas. <gasps> right? right? You felt exactly how Joseph felt. Would you be angry? Yes. If you were not going to be angry, uh, there's something wrong with you. If you showed up at your fiance's house and you haven't seen her in seven or eight months and you show up at her doorstep and she's pregnant, that's nuts. It's crazy. Of course you would be upset. You would be angry. You would be devastated. Darn right, you'd be upset. And imagine you were Joseph. I'm sure his thought life went something like this. I've been keeping myself pure. I've been back, uh, back away. I've been getting the house ready. I've been getting my job ready. I've been saving up the money so that I can come to her this day, have a day of celebration. That day was supposed to turn out as a day of celebration. When he showed up, he took her back and he said to everyone, we're married. And everybody in the town knew she was pregnant when he showed up. Her parents knew she was pregnant when he showed up. Talk about an awkward situation. Who is it? I'm sure Joseph thought. Is it the mailman? You know, is it the goat herder down the street? And Mary replies, oh, it's not any of them. It's the Holy Spirit. What a bizarre answer. This is real life stuff that we're talking about. Now, I know many of us grew up in a church where we look at this passage of scripture and we understand this, this, everything that's happening and everything that's taking place. But Joseph didn't. Joseph didn't understand. In fact, Joseph did not believe Mary. We can see that in the passage in Matthew 1, 19. Her husband, Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Joseph believed that Mary was lying to him. But because he was a just man, he decided, I'm going to divorce her quietly. See, if he had believed Mary, if he had believed her story, he would not have considered getting a divorce. So that takes us to our first Christmas survival survival tip with our family. This season, like every Christmas so far, you will have family tell you wild and unbelievable tales when they gather with you. They're going to have you, they're going to tell you stories about promotions that never happened. They're going to tell you stories about people they're dating, relationships. They're going to tell you about the successes of their children that never happened. They're going to make things up. Some of them are. They might even tell you about a dating life that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, is non-existent. So the first Christmas survival tip, as we look at this passage of Scripture, do not assume you are right. There is always more to the story. Joseph believed he was right. Joseph believed Mary was a liar. He believed that Mary was wrong. That is why he had set in his heart to divorce her. The story that Mary told him was crazy. The Holy Spirit got me pregnant. Would you believe that if you were Joseph? No. Why? It was unheard of. It was unheard of. He was embarrassed. He was angry. He was hurt. He was also wrong to believe the worst about Mary. 
He suffered emotionally as he wrestled with what he was going to do because he chose not to believe Mary's story. He decided to, decided to divorce her quietly because he was wrong. See, even if a relative story this season sounds made up, even if it sounds far-fetched, even if it sounds crazy, do not assume that you are right. There is always more to the story. Now, the more to the story might be your relative needs some medication. <laughs> that may be the more to the story. But do your best not to jump to conclusions. In fact, even though Joseph was wrong, even though he was flat out wrong about Mary, he was still going to show great mercy to her. See, in this culture, when the bride came for his, uh, when the groom would come for his bride, the two would come, go back to his home and they would have sex. Then if the groom discovered she had already lost her virginity, she could be stoned to death. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 20, Uh, the author writes, but if this accusation is true and no evidence of the young woman's virginity is found, listen to what they will do. They will bring the woman to the door of her father's house and the men of her city will stone her to death. For she has committed an outrage in Israel by being promiscuous in her father's house. Even though Joseph could have had Mary stoned because pregnancy is pretty, pretty much proof, right? Rock solid proof that you've not been faithful. Rock solid proof that you're no longer a virgin. Even though Joseph had every, every right, even biblical right to have Mary stoned, to grab her and to take her to the doorstep of her father's house and have the men of the city come out and stone her, he chose not to. He chose a merciful path, and his reaction leads us into our second survival tip. Around your family this, this season, around the awkwardness this season, do not let your feelings determine your behavior. Let God determine your behavior. See, Joseph, even though he was wrong, Joseph didn't allow his feelings to enact revenge on Mary. He didn't take it out on her. He didn't even follow the Old Testament law to a T. Instead of choosing to stone her, he chose to divorce her quietly. Why? Because he didn't allow his feelings to control the situation. The Bible tells us that he was a just man and didn't want her family to be shamed. And he didn't want Mary to be shamed. Even though he was hurt, he didn't wish that his, his wife and her family be humiliated. That speaks to me as I get around family every time. Do I always have to be right? Do I always have to point out that they're wrong? Do I always need to point out things in their life that I think they're lying about? No, neither do you. See, you and I get the opportunity to not allow our feelings to control our behavior when we get around them. We're going to be around even some distant cousins that we don't always agree with, even just their personalities that rub us the wrong way. But don't allow your feelings to control your behavior. Instead, let God determine your behavior this season. N not to prove you're right, not to humiliate them. See, your feelings are going to be hurt this Christmas season. Somebody's going to hurt your feelings. Maybe it's somebody that is not as grateful as they ought to be. Maybe it's somebody that is, is not as kind or ignores you. Somebody's going to step on your toes. Maybe somebody is going to speak harshly to you. Maybe they're going to complain about the food being burnt or the food not tasting right. Maybe somebody is still going to give you the, the silent treatment after 20 years. They still won't speak to you when you're in the same house. Maybe somebody is going to gossip about you or they'll lie about you. Or maybe the worst case scenario, Cousin Eddie shows up while you're lighting the house with Christmas lights. And his family. <laughs> Everybody familiar with Cousin Eddie? Raise your hand if you're familiar with Cousin Eddie. Okay. Just want to make sure. I think we all have a little bit of Cousin Eddie in us personally and also in our families. 
But if you want to survive and thrive during the Christmas season, you must not allow your feelings to determine your course of action. You must, al- uh, you must invite God to determine how you respond. The Apostle Paul, a follower of Jesus, wrote this in Romans 12. He says, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. That means family, and that means friends, and that means distant family, and that means the in-laws that you might disagree with, or the cousins that you disagree with, or the spouse that you may disagree with, or your children that have grown up that you may disagree with. You must live in such a way that you do everything you can to live in peace with everyone. Verse 19, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. You see, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've really received Jesus as your Savior, if you've invited him to be your Lord, if you've confessed your sin, if you've asked forgiveness for your sins and you've been born again or you've been made new as the Bible calls, if you've entered into that relationship with God through Jesus, then this passage gets to boss you around. That passage from Romans 12 gets to tell you how to interact with your family when you disagree with them, when your family, when you get hurt by them. That passage of scripture gets to own you this Christmas season, especially as you live your life around a family that might be filled with a bunch of cousin Eddie's. You know, this this passage tells us how to live. When we respond to others based off our emotions, we escalate the situation. We make things more tense for everybody else that's in the room with us. God has a better path and a better plan for our lives. Now, raise your hand if you've ever escalated a situation because of your emotions. Everybody that doesn't have your hand up, come on, come on, be honest. We've all been there. We've all stuck our foot in our mouths. We've all known that the moment we said something we shouldn't have, we saw it trigger anger in somebody else. They get more upset than we get more upset, than our children get more upset. Everybody around us gets more upset because we chose to escalate the situation based off our emotions instead of being self-controlled, instead of allowing this passage from Romans to tell us how to live. Now, Raise your hand if you want your Christmas season with family to be filled with peace this season. It's up to you. If you want your Christmas season filled with peace, then you have to choose to lay down your selfish rights. You have to choose to be a sacrifice. You have to choose to retaliate with genuine kindness. You have to choose to offer them something to eat and drink in the midst of disagreeing with them. You have to conquer evil by doing good. You have to choose to never pay back evil with more evil. You have to choose the honorable path. In other words, you have to choose to be like Jesus around your family and friends. Because the truth that you've been sharing about them, the truth that you've given your life to Jesus, that you've followed him, that you've been baptized and that you attend Calvary is not going to mean anything to them if they don't see a change in your life. It's not going to mean anything. All those words that you've been telling them about how important Jesus is to them won't mean anything to them if you're not Jesus to them. How did Jesus respond? How did Jesus live? He turned the other cheek. He showed kindness to the sinners. He showed grace. He showed compassion. He showed mercy. And God has taken you to the mission field of your Christmas family celebration to be Jesus to them by showing and telling, but by showing them more that your love for Jesus is real, that you've really been changed by Jesus and you can show them the kindness and the grace that Jesus has shown to you, even if you believe you are right. Even if you believe that you are right, choose to be the sacrifice. And that leads us to the third survival tip. Do not be judgmental. Choose to be merciful rather than right. 
Show kindness anyway. Show kindness when your family doesn't make sense. That is what mercy is. Mercy is undeserved kindness. That means your family doesn't deserve you to show mercy to them. Show them mercy anyway. Why? We don't deserve God to show mer uh, kindness to us, but he shows mercy to us anyway. Mercy is undeserved kindness. It's what it is. So choose to show undeserved kindness to your family and to your in-laws and to your cousins and to your cousins' eddies and all your ne nieces and nephews and grandchildren. Choose to go the path that Jesus went. Now, the other man that was raised by Joseph, James, he was a half-brother to Jesus. He wrote that mercy triumphs over judgment. It's always better to be merciful. It's always better to be merciful other than to show judgment. Your judgment might be right, but mercy is what's desired. And as we interact with spouses, family, grandparents, grandchildren, be merciful. Show undeserved kindness. Now, Scripture isn't filled with a lot of passages about, the, about Joseph, the stepdad of Jesus, but it's from this sliver of Scripture that we read that he was a just man and he didn't want Mary to be put to shame and he didn't want family to be put to shame that we can see a little bit about Joseph, that even though he made a wrong conclusion, he could have chosen to stone Mary, but instead he chose to divorce her quietly because he was a man who was bold in grace. He was a man who was bold in forgiveness. And I really believe that there's something about this passage of Scripture that spoke to Jesus years later. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but we all know that parents, we obviously influence our children. And we know that for a season, Joseph raised Jesus. He was his earthly father here on this earth. And I think about the shame that Mary must have experienced. I think about the whispers she still must have experienced. People in the community still looked at Jesus, not as a son of God as he was growing up, but as a son of somebody else, not Joseph, when he was growing up. Je Jesus saw how Joseph handled that. He saw how that shame was there. And I believe it speaks volumes when Jesus talks about grace. And I believe it speaks volumes when Jesus teaches us about mercy and kindness. I believe there's something to be said about the way parents and grandparents, we represent Jesus to our children and to our grandchildren in the, in the confines of close family. When we're close together, when we're getting rubbed the wrong way, your children are going to be looking up to you to see how they should respond when things are crazy, when things are awkward, when things are tense, when things don't go right, when plans fail, when traffic is bad, when the Christmas lights don't work. They are going to be looking at you and I and how we respond today is how they will respond tomorrow. We model behavior for them. Whether you're a grandparent, whether you're a great-grandparent, whether you're a cousin, they are looking up to us as adults. So make the decision to choose to show mercy over judgment toward your family this Christmas season. And that takes us to the fourth and final Christmas survival tip. Do not get distracted. Center Christmas around Jesus. Now, it's cliche to say this. But every one of us knows Jesus is the reason for the... We all know that, but do we live like that? Right? We run around and we buy the gifts and we get the house and decorations and wrap the presents and get the food right and make time for family and friends and visits and travel. Are we really making sure that our families understand Jesus is the center of our lives. Not just the center of Christmas, but of our lives. 
One of the things that I love that what my wife does with our kids, and when I say my wife does it, I'm there and I'm with her, but it's her thing. She runs with it every Christmas. Every Christmas Eve, they'll bake cakes or cupcakes or something inside that represents Jesus. And that we'll sing a birthday, happy birthday song to Jesus. And we'll make sure that we're, we're praying and we're worshiping Jesus on Christmas Eve. And we make sure that we remind them, we read the Christmas story. And our girls act out the Christmas story. And it's so neat to see them who, you know, fighting over who gets to be baby Jesus. You know, and, and they'll be Mary and they'll be Joseph. And they'll, they know the whole meaning of Christmas from the story but I wonder, do they see it lived out in me? Do they believe that daddy believes Jesus is the center of all that we do because of what I say or because of what we do and how we love other people and how we care about other people? Do they see that or do they see me just blah, 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 the Christmas story, happy birthday, Jesus, now let's open our presents. It's my prayer that they would see a man that's centered on Jesus because I want them to model that in their lives as well. So what will you choose to center your life around this Christmas season? How will you choose to live this Christmas season? Will you choose to live differently than maybe your, your friends and family that aren't yet followers of Jesus? Man, my prayer is that you would. My prayer is that we would be a people of God that display the light of Jesus to our families and our friends this Christmas season and that we are able to abundantly show mercy, abundantly show kindness, and abundantly show grace day in and day out, even when it's the most awkward. Because when it's the most awkward, how we respond to that proves what we really genuinely believe. So Christmas survival tip, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And as we focus on Jesus, he will enable us to love others unconditionally. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the truth. As we look at this passage of scripture, there's incredible truth. These truths that can be drawn out. Father, thank you for the way that Mary conceived through the Holy Spirit. What an incredible miracle. What an amazing thing. Thank you for the response of Joseph, that we are able to look at his reaction, how he responded, and draw out applications to our own lives. Lord, I pray that you would bless each and every family that's represented here. Lord, we want them to experience genuine peace with their families. We want them to experience genuine hope with their families. Help them to be the bearers of truth this Christmas season to point other people to Jesus, not through just what they say, but how they interact through their relationships with their family. When it's awkward, when it's difficult, when it is crazy, bless them with a right mind that brings peace to crazy situations. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.